I understand you right that you said 99% of the world's energy will be in Bitcoin mining. At some point, 99% of our energy production will be for Bitcoin. If we want a future in space, Bitcoin is actually inevitable. 9,000 kilowatt hours per person. And we've been at this level for the last 50 years. The last 50 years, basically, the energy consumption per person has yes. stayed the same as it was 50 years ago. Humanity has not actually progressed in terms of energy production at all. At some point, we might encircle the sun with solar panels and this will be uh, around the orbit of Mercury so all the all the Bitcoin mining will happen there and you could buy a Tesla for one Bitcoin now you buy a car then you will buy a house and at some point it will buy you a large space station with uh, millions of, of square miles of space what will be the tipping point for Bitcoin mass adoption so um, to introduce myself, I started actually last year on Instagram um, when this whole ChatGPT uh, mid journey thing kicked off. You know, uh, I always was interested in science fiction and writing in general. And I had this just very abstract idea of um, what happens if one day, uh, many hundreds of years in the future, um, humans are gone and there are only rats and they pick up the pieces, you know, of their, of the humans and they slowly discover the, the world humanity has left behind. And, um, yeah. So in this, in this world there, we have colonized space and we're still using the time chain to, um, trade, to, agree on things to have a legal system and yeah i started publishing short stories i still don't know where i want to go with this um, this year i started on x um, also interacting uh, primarily because i also wanted to get a bit into the mind of of bitcoiners um, because as i as i did the research uh, for these stories i figured out if we want uh, future in space, Bitcoin is actually inevitable. And um, so we had a space race in the 60s, in the 70s, and it all looked like um, this will go on a, on a straight trajectory. We will go to Mars by the 2000s, have a presence on the moon in the, in the 80s. Right? That's what everyone thought back then. And um, this dream didn't pan out and um, maybe it's because of the fiat system. Because um, if you don't have a hard money, your, your narrative needs to be, you need to save energy. Because there's um, all the incentives are aligned that your, your, your money loses purchasing power constantly. You cannot save. So what do you need to do? You need to um, limit your expenditures. And if you, I don't know if you know the chart from uh, what the fuck happens in 1971, there is this very interesting chart about the energy consumption and that has uh, stayed static at uh, uh, 9,000 kilowatt hours per person. And we've been at this level for the last 50 years. So. Um, humanity has not actually progressed in terms of energy production at all. Um, so how do we get out of this, right? That's, that's a question. And, that, that's um, really interesting. I didn't even knew that. I, I knew the I know the side, but I've not uh, studied all the charts there. So like the last 50 years, basically, the energy consumption per person has yes. stayed the same as it was 50 years later, like it completely st exactly. stayed the same. Exactly, right. Uh, I mean, one part is that we're getting more efficient. We have better technology, um, but in general, you would assume that this uh, goes up, uh, but that's not the case because there's uh, no real driving force, no economic incentive to uh, have more energy consumption per person. And yeah, if we want to, uh, explore space, we need, need a lot more energy. Mm -hmm. And also what's interesting, there 
is also this idea um, to put solar panels into orbit, right? Um, the problem with that is how do you get the energy uh, down to Earth? And we have a solution now since 2008. Um, we just mine Bitcoin in space. And because you can always exchange Bitcoin for energy, right? It's a, it's a derivative on, on energy production. It's like in, back in the gold standards, you had your dollars, you could exchange them for gold. If you have Bitcoin, you can go to a miner and say, Hey, um, I want your energy, uh, turn off your miner. So, uh, you can, uh, exchange your Bitcoin for energy. And so the idea is if we put solar panels in orbit, satellites basically, uh, put miners on them, um, we can, this idea can be economically feasible, which is, it was not before. Interesting. And do you, yeah. Do you also think that we, we could live like an, an, an energy abundant, uh, future when, when we have Bitcoin, when we have some money and like the, the financial layer is, is, is sound. Yeah, definitely. So it all, interestingly, it all, it all, uh, uh, ties together, right? The, um, let's imagine the, the hash rate has actually doubled every year since Bitcoin's inception. And we are right now at, uh, I think it's below 1% of the world's energy production is in Bitcoin. And if this trend continues at some point, uh, 99% of our energy production will be for Bitcoin and all our human needs will be, uh, basically the waste, the wasted energy. Yeah. I published this, this, this ex post where I, I looked at, okay, what would happen if, uh, this hash rate will double uh, for the next hundred years and First, we will um, eat more and more uh, of the ener Earth's energy production we currently have, right? And then miners will need to go in themselves into the energy producing business because they, both from political uh, forces and also economic forces, uh, they can't take our energy. So they, we need to raise our energy production to meet Bitcoin's demand at some point. Because right now it's more or less stranded energy. Miners are using the, the stranded energy. Um, we're not building power plants to exclusively mine Bitcoin right now. There are some old power plants, I think, that are used. But in general, it's not like, hey, um, let's build these uh, huge solar farms uh, to, to exclusively mine Bitcoin, right? It's more of an afterthought or to use the stranded energy. Um, for me, it's, it's interesting for, when you say like 99% of the world's energy will be for, like, did I understand you right that you said 99% of the world's energy will be in Bitcoin mining? Yes. It's interesting. That will probably happen sooner than we think. Oh. Um, because, um, we're now at 1% and if it doubles every year, right in in, in, in six years, we, are, we, we would be there already if this trend continues, of course. But, but um, there are a lot of questions in my mind now because uh, one is like, like I till now, and maybe I'm wrong, till now I thought Bitcoin mining will have a long way to go up. Uh, like we have a long way till, till we reach like a certain uh, amount and then we will not expand the hash rate too much. Uh, uh, with every year, I, I, I always thought it will always go up uh, as the world and as the power grows, but I didn't thought that it goes mm -hmm. that much up, but I never thought about it, like how, how many percent of the world's energy it will actually um, uh, consume. So I never thought about that. So forgive me for <laughs> not being that much educated yeah. on that. Um, but uh, my thought in my head right now is, Uh, we have a base layer constraint, and I talked with we, we talked before we recorded about Wicked uh, really quick, 
uh, and Wicked has the opinion that because of UTXO management and because of constraints of the base layer, there will be a maximum of like five to 10 million institutions or individuals that be, will be able to uh, interchange their Bitcoin on the base layer. Um, and then I also talked with uh, with Salef, uh, uh just a few a few days ago, and he also said the average transaction um, um, uh, average transaction on the base layer, measured in fiat terms, of course, uh, will go up crazy. You know, like now, it's like whatever, like two hundred or, or twenty euros, uh, and then we have like soon like two thousand and twenty thousand, and maybe some day, someday two million as an average transaction uh, in fiat terms on the base layer. Um, will, will will the base layer ju- just be like a, like I thought that the base layer will be a settlement layer? For really big and important transactions, so not used on a daily basis, and therefore not always expanding uh, in infinity till like the 99% that you just said, uh, the energy consumption. Or so, like, am I wrong here? So a few thoughts on that. In in my stories, um, Bitcoin or as we call it, the time chain, is used also to uh, secure. The, the spacecraft movements. So you, uh, on a on a on a solar system scale, right? You need to synchronize uh, spacecraft movements, and you have issues like what what comes first, right? What is now? You don't know what now is. There is no objective now, right? Um, so if if you want to synchronize uh, orbital movements on a grander scale. Uh, you need a very secure layer, a layer where we have universal consensus and where we can, so to say, inscribe um, our objective reality into. And um, of course, that will be very expensive because there's a lot of value in it um, that, let's say, countries um, or at some point even planets, uh, orbital settlements can do settlement of their financial um, structures, of their economic uh, state, uh, of their legal system at some point. And um, at this scale, this uh, block size limit actually becomes a feature because you have uh, limited bandwidth in space. You have this inverse square law, so the the energy uh, goes up exponentially the further the distance. So I uh, have this block size limit is actually a feature because uh, we have a bandwidth constraint. And uh, why would you break, want to break this, um, this important feature? You can always have second layers, right? For your local, for your local uh, economies, right? Let's say a, a country, a planet does local commerce. Uh, at some point you wouldn't do that on the base layer you would do only the things that you need to synchronize um, between, let's say, jurisdictions. Mm. So that it's it's so it's even more than than just money. It's like a time chain where you can actually secure stuff on there, and, and that's why there's so much valuable, let's just call it, <laughs> to to use a simple term, stuff on on the Bitcoin main chain with all this layer two and layer three. Um, technologies that it actually makes sense then it's like a big percentage of the world's energy is in there it's really interesting i have to um, really dive deep in this uh, how much of the percentage of the world's energy will bitcoin mine like i I never looked it up i'm embarrassed (laughs) yeah so the other the other reason why it it might go up as it has been right it doubles every year so every year new miners basically try to do a 50% attack. So you have the existing miners, they have their machines, right? And every year, the same amount of machines comes online. So it's, 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 it's basically a game theory uh, conundrum that uh, this, this 50% attack happens every year by, by new miners and also existing miners need to step up, you know, or their, their, their business will, will fail. So I also see this game theoretical incentive to 
double the mining uh, hash rate every year. And um, it's not that, that like um, the percentage uh, has to go straight up because at some point, as said, the miners will also uh, build their own power plants. Um, at some point, it will be very economically uh, feasible to uh, build the mining rigs in space. And that will also drive development of space, of course, because uh, you have the mining satellites there, you need to build the infrastructure, you need to maybe even have people living in space long term to maintain it. Uh, depends how robotics will go, but um, you know, it, it, it will be uh, very economically feasible to do so. And we, we, we have no other technology currently, uh, maybe besides asteroids mining, um, that, that, uh, makes sense to do in space. So I, Bitcoin I, is kind of the first one where it makes sense to do it. I also heard, and I'm again, no expert in this topic, unfortunately, uh, but I heard that, uh, um, uh, block time could be, could, could be one of the reasons why Bitcoin uh, cannot scale on multiplanetary uh, as a multiplanetary currency. Do we have to change something in the code or is, is Bitcoin already ready for like this expansion to, to another planet? Yeah, so um, there, there, there are many different uh, thoughts on this, right? Um, like many different camps on, on how this could go because probably there are many different, different, different outcomes, how this could go. Um, there's the, the theory that, uh, we will have, uh, competing once we colonize Mars, that we will have a competing Bitcoin there, right? Because, uh, in, on Mars, you cannot mine Bitcoin because of the light lag. Um, so we might have, uh, a, a competing Bitcoin on Mars at some point. Um, the problem with that is that, um, the energy production on Mars is much more expensive because in a, in a solar, in a, in a solar powered uh, economy, the closer you are to the sun, the, the more efficient your power panels are. Um, so, uh, why would you invest into Mars coin, uh, if you get a more Bitcoin, uh, in the, in the very long term, uh, for your, for your investment? Right. But in the, in the short term, this could happen that we have a, a second Bitcoin on Mars. Um, I think very long term, it, uh, will, uh, if we, if we increase on, on our development on the Kardashev scale, that at some point we might, uh, encircle the sun with solar panels. And this will be, uh, around the orbit of Mercury. So all the, all the Bitcoin mining will happen there. And, uh, that's still within the 10 minute window, um, where the, where the mining can take place. And, um, you can do like, you can do Bitcoin transactions over a much longer, uh, time scale. Uh, so, um, you can send your transaction. It's signed. It doesn't matter, uh, if it's within that 10 minute window, right? Um, It's just about the mining. Where will the mining happen? And, uh, that might long term, and we're talking probably 100 years plus, um, happen, happen around Mercury. And, and we might develop Mercury at this point to, to mine Bitcoin. Like we will literally destroy Mercury, turn the whole planet into solar panels, uh, just to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> I love that. But that's when that's when uh, we will have in in today's purchasing power we will have one trillion dollars per satoshi, not per Bitcoin per satoshi, because that's the that's the energy equivalent to that kind of power at this point. Uh, how uh, do do we have the US dollar at, at at this point? Like, does it even matter to to measure it in in US dollars and, and um, other currencies than than Bitcoin? I. I don't know, right? Um, in, in, in my stories, uh, the currency is nanos, which is a nano Satoshi. So, uh, we probably use lightning network or something similar, uh, some layer someday on top of Bitcoin. 
And uh, Lightning already has these uh, sub-Satoshi denominations, right? You can transact fractions of a Satoshi. And it, it, it doesn't make much sense to me that once we have a, a sound money that is tied to, ener to, to energy, right? We had it at some point. The, the German word for money is what? Geld? No, the other one. Währung? Kohle. Kohle. <laughs> so at some point we had, right, we had uh, uh, energy-based currency uh, when, when in, the, in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution we had uh, people used actual coal, coal to, to, to barter um, because they were also paid in coal uh, for some time. They were just paid in coal and transacted using that. And that's where this word came from. Um, so it doesn't make sense to have a, a derivative uh, once you have the real thing, right? Why would you dilute your measuring capability? It's like you already have a perfect meter, right? You already have the metric system and then you build something on top of that to have something that's that's less precise. Why would you do that? Joseph is then really interesting uh, when we have this uh, sci-fi thought where there's multiple planets using Bitcoin, not just Earth. And Earth probably also expands till then. Uh, so Bitcoin does not expand. It's like this 21 million uh, limit and probably it's more like 15 million uh, because things getting lost and stuff like that. But then we have like on Earth, 8 billion people. Maybe at this point we have like 15 billion people on Earth. And then we have uh, uh, pe people on other planets. Then we, I don't know, have maybe even other species, rats. <laughs> uh, yes, probably. So th then it's like um, one Satoshi and, and one Bitcoin. It's, it's so hard to grasp what you can buy with that when like one... A unit of that is 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 uh, has to be strep, spread out between so many people and so many institutions and so many uh, entities. It's a, it's an interesting thought that kind of expands your mind that what one Satoshi can can buy you at one point. Yeah, it will probably buy you a, a, a space station uh, at some point, right? Uh, I always thought my I always said uh, a few years ago. Uh, my retirement plan is to uh, buy a SpaceX Starship with one Bitcoin at some point. Okay, so one, uh, because one. I think at some point that would be the price, right? Um, once we go into uh, private Starships, uh, that will happen, you know. Uh, uh, rich people at some point, they, they don't want yachts or planes. If, if there is space spaceships, uh, they will buy the, those. But yeah. Uh, probably uh, at some point you can buy one for one Bitcoin. Amazing. Everything that Elon Musk uh, uh, built so so expensively and does for him, at some point in the future we can just buy it with one Bitcoin that some people like bought for $100. <laughs> yeah, but you know, uh, I think this was 2021 where you could buy a Tesla for one Bitcoin, right? That was about the, the, the amount. I think in, in 10 or 20 years, uh, it's not unreasonable to believe if, if Bitcoin develops uh, like it did before, right? Uh, we don't know that, but it looks like it will. It, it, now you buy a car, then you will buy a house. And at some point, you know, uh, it will, it will buy you a large space station with, uh, millions of, of square miles of space. You also brought up the concept of, of time chain a lot. Um, first of all, like for, for people that are a little bit newer here, uh, if they know, uh, if they are still here, um, what, what do you think is the concept of time chain? Like, like what, what, what is like, why are we Bitcoiners saying so many times like Bitcoin is time and, and, and Bitcoin is the time chain rather than the blockchain? Because what, um, at least from my understanding, right? Uh, I, I, I could be wrong here uh, on the details, but uh, what uh, Bitcoin essentially solves from an engineering standpoint is um, consensus about um, what happened first. Because in the real world, there is no mechanism to guarantee 
you have two events that happen. You have no guarantee which event happens in which order. It's referred, I think, to this uh, three generous problem. That's the that's the theoretical framework behind it, uh, where you you need to synchronize uh, knowledge between parties that don't trust each, each other, uh, yet they still want to come up with a, a objective truth, uh, and that's actually what Bitcoin solves. So Bitcoin creates this uh, objective truth: what was first. You have one transaction in block A and uh, then in the next block you have another transaction and it's guaranteed um, that the order happened like this and it, you cannot shuffle it around, right? If you used uh, normal clocks, right, or you use uh, traditional software, you you have a timestamp there, but the timestamp is not objective, it's your computer's clock and that's always it's always off. And Bitcoin is the first technology where we have on a global scale an objective decentralized uh, clock, basically. What do you think are the implications of that? Like, is that changing? Uh, is, is that changing the world in a major way? Um, I think we right now we we need trusted parties to. Uh, know which which event came first, right? We and we also have the luxury of a very fast internet. But once you know, once we go out into space and light lag becomes an issue, right? On the moon, you have a second uh, back and forth. It's already a noticeable delay. Uh, if you go to Mars, you're out five minutes. Um, so you then it becomes really important if you want to do any you know, financial transactions, any commerce, right? You need an objective truth, what came first. And so um, Bitcoin is one way to guarantee that. And, and we need that's the innovation, need, basically. And we need that uh, in the future when we want to be multiplanetary because it's important what came first. Uh, that's an interesting thought. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so my idea was also you have this, these lanes in space where you can use gravity assists to propel your spacecraft for uh, much cheaper costs, right? You don't need that much, much rocket fuel. So to avoid collisions, to basically reserve your slot, um, you inscribe that on the time chain. And uh, in that way, it's, it's ob you have an objective reservation of your, of your journey, basically. Yeah. If you have many uh, many planets that not necessarily uh, agree, uh, they they can opt to agree on on this one Bitcoin standard, and, and th this problem is solved for them at least. I mean, they still need, all need to say we we want to use Bitcoin, of course, right? If they're everyone is using a competing system, uh, it's it's still a problem. But uh, we can delegate this consensus to this one layer that solves this issue to solve this issue for us. So. Um, it doesn't only solve money, it solves all synchronization problems we have. And you also wrote about the, I, I never can pronounce it, the Kada, Kada chef scale. Uh, yeah, so the, the, and, and this also plays in that, that we are moving on in the scale up to a type one uh, civilization. Maybe for those who are not familiar with it, like what is that scale and, and, and how does it apply with Bitcoin? Yeah. So the, the Kardashev scale was developed in the, in the 60s by Russian astronomer Nikolai Kardashev. And uh, his idea was basically that uh, solar power is the most efficient form of energy because we have this huge uh, fusion reactor in the sky. And uh, even if we master fusion ourselves on Earth, right, uh, the sun is still more efficient. So. The, the, his idea was the measure of a civilization is how much of the sun's output uh, is the civilization using. Right now, um, we're at level 0 0.7, where level one is we use all the sunlight that gets hit by Earth, which is um, a 10 billionth of the total sun output. So we're 10, 
uh, t- 10 trillion times, we have 10 trillion times more potential as a, as a, as a solar system species uh, to the amount of energy we can harness because uh, that energy now just goes into space, right? It's wasted. Um, we have 4 billion years left to use the sun as an energy source, then it will run out. And um, every year we're waiting, we're, we're basically wasting this energy. Um, so we're now uh, one thousand, one thousandth uh, on the way to get to this K1 status. So if we increase the energy production by a thousand times, we will have K1 status. Imagine you build uh, uh, solar powered satellites around Earth. Uh, you build up the solar panels also on the surface. Uh, you use as, as much of the energy that's available to the Earth for free. Uh, then you're at K1 status, right? Um, and um, that allows you to develop uh, to the next stage. That would be K2, um, cutter shift 2 level, where you use all the energy of the sun. Uh, it's what I mentioned before, uh, where we basically in, encircle the sun uh, around Mercury. We dismantle Mercury and build uh, build solar panels and harness all the power of the sun. And uh, yeah, that uh, gives you plenty of opportunities. Uh, of course, I believe we will use it 99% to mine Bitcoin. And uh, with this 1%, we will have... Uh, abundance for everyone. We can do interstellar colonization, do whatever we want, right? Um, and that's the that's the K2 level, basically. Um, that's, as I said, uh, 10 trillion times more energy than we use today. Uh, it's hard to grasp, but uh, uh, yeah, even even if we use 99% for, for Bitcoin, you know, it's <laughs> It's still 100 million uh, times more uh, than we use today. And there's then also the uh, K3 level where we basically go interstellar and uh, do this basically to every star in our galaxy. Uh, And that's again, uh, 10 billion times more uh, energy that would be available to us. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now, let's get back to the video. Do you plan to do the right Write a book around that topic. I feel like that's like there are many great articles from you, and and I love the the talking points that we already have here. And there could be an extremely well written uh, sci-fi story around that that's a little bit longer uh, and with a nice character and everything. Like I, I would love yeah, that's, to. That's read what I'm book. doing. That's what I'm doing. Right. So Ratoshi is one of the characters in the story. Um, he f- he found uh, he found lost private keys, right? And imagine in two hundred years from now, someone finds a Bitcoin wallet with zero point one Bitcoin on it, right? It would be instant fortune. Absolutely. Um, so, but you you did not uh, write the book till now. You're only writing. Oh, I'm one. I'm writing for a year now. You know, I. I Unfortunately, I, I still have a, a fiat business, so I, I don't have much time to work on the book. Um, but I've been I've been uh, collecting uh, storylines and and writing chapters. The the issue is 
I I want to have the world building perfect, right? I uh, I want to have the the world built out before I really dive into the stories. Um, but there's some there's some stories still in there, um, and the the main storyline is basically centered around uh, a group of lawyers, but they're rats, of course, and um, they they unlock some mysteries uh, surrounding the time chain, its history, its future. They want to figure out what happened to the humans um, because they're gone, right? Um, what did they, what did the humans do? They don't know yet. So that's the, that's the story basically. Why rats? Um, it's just a personal thing, I guess. Oh, okay. uh, it's it's more of a coincidence. I, I played around with Mid Journey. And uh, at some point it, it generated rats and I just followed up on that. And then I introduced, you know, all the topics I love, uh, Bitcoin, space, uh, lawyering, um, all, all that, all that stuff. So, and, and somehow this, this narrative evolved and yeah, um, I'm developing it and we'll see where it goes. Right. Um, I first tried uh, publishing these short stories. You can find them on my Instagram, uh, Rotificial. Um, but somehow Instagram really punished the, the, the non-video content, right? Uh, it's pretty much dead for non-video content, unfortunately. Um, that's why I moved over to X and uh, writing there now. Yeah, we'll see if there's a, there's a book coming out at some point. Um, yeah, so that's the plan for that. You could uh, put those uh, um, texts just in like a voice generator and let it run on on a video, uh, because I also think like it's it's sad that every platform, even X, uh, they are promoting with the algorithms. Like if you have the same amount of of inputs, your video gets two x more reach from a natural perspective. Uh, a standpoint than your text. Of course, the text could go more viral if it hits something else, but yeah. in general, you get a 2x boost just with the video. Uh, it's it's a sad thing to say, so see, but that's just where the attention is right now and people want to see. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like yeah. Yeah. I, tried a, I tried a few generators, right? Uh, so far, they didn't, they didn't work for me, right? Um, it, it was still a lot of manual uh, editing involved and stuff like that. So, uh, right now it's, 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 it's much more time efficient, right? To, to focus on my stories. Occasionally I put, uh, some story on X or, or Instagram, but yeah, if I wanted to be a content producer, content creator, that's probably what I, what I should do, right? Um, create this short form video generated st stuff. Um, Maybe that's uh, what I will go back to. It's actually quite a good idea um, to, to, to promote the account, right? Because what good is a book if uh, no one knows about it, then no one can read it. Yeah, and uh, I mean, once it's finished, like then uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> I, I, the, the one thing that came in my mind when, when you said it, uh, it's still a lot of manual work. It's a lot of like, I make this uh, short form content from my long form po podcast and people think, yeah, I just press a button and then there's like five videos coming out of that. And it's like five videos out of a like one or one and a half hour podcast still take me like one, one and a half hours to edit and get everything done. And that's yeah. including already, I use a lot of AI tools. But I have a high standard. I, I want to not just pump out any video. If I just want to out pump out any video, then it's easy. Yeah, I can just generate yeah, 40 yeah. videos and publish them all. <laughs> but they, they are mostly garbage if you don't edit them a little bit. Yeah, so, it's quite yeah. ironic, right? Uh, what I heard uh, from many content creators actually now, their first, their first employee actually is just for these short form videos, right? Uh, like you 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 have a lot of time on your hands to produce the long form that you actually want right and your your loyal viewers want to see but for the the, the doom scrolling uh, it's a it's a second full-time job actually it's, it's a ma major thing yeah. Um, yeah but yeah let's uh, let's come back to the topic and maybe a little bit closer to 
to the here and now. You also wrote an article that I saw on X about the coexisting from Bitcoin and CBDCs. I mean, we kind of already touched on it, but do you see like a, a medium term possibility that uh, CBDCs and, 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 and Bitcoin coexist? Yeah, so um, how to get into that? Uh, what, what I noticed that um, why do we have this uh, flat line of, of standard of living and energy production for the past 50 years, right? Uh, many many Bitcoiners believe uh, it's because we don't have hard money, right? Um, I don't think that's the, the main reason, actually. Um, the reason is in 1971 was the uh, release of the first Intel processor. And uh, since then, we've seen uh, just unprecedented levels uh, of devaluation of human labor. So the, the worth of your working hour basically went down uh, every year because more and more jobs could be automated. Um, in the, in the, in the sixties, seventies, you still have, you had human calculators, right? Computer was job description. It was a human doing calculations, right? Uh, and then we had, uh, commercially available computers for the first time and, uh, businesses started to use them. And, um, we've seen ever increasing levels of, of automation. So it's, it's not just this last uh, few years where we have AI, right? We have 50, a backlog of 50 years of automation happening. Uh, you can see that everywhere. Uh, look, uh, I still remember, uh, 20 years ago going to a gas station where there were people there, right? And they, they, they filled up the car for you. They checked your, your, your oil and they checked your tires and stuff. They washed your windshield, right? There were three people working at this gas station, tending to customers and that has disappeared, right? Um, because that process has been automated. I mean, the customer is now doing the job, but it's still, it's still automation. Uh, same in the supermarkets. You, you have much less, less cashiers because you have this automated process. Um, so what has happened? Um, the value of human labor has gone down, um, faster than inflation. So the inflation adjusted thing, if you look at any prices of, of things, of uh, housing, gold, like anything that holds, holds value, right? Uh, stocks, uh, the hours needed to, to work for an ounce of gold has increased, uh, you need, uh, Back in 1970s, you needed to work um, two years. So the average two-year salary has paid for a house, and now you need eight years. So um, not only did uh, did we remove the capability for people to save their money, right? We also uh, took away their capabilities to earn money, except for a few fields like IT. The, in IT, for instance, the wages have more or less kept up with inflation, um, but we're still not, uh, not there. If, if, if you, if you adjust it correctly, the, the median salary would have to be 300,000 a year, right? Uh, not a lot of people make that. I would say it's, it's less than 1%, um, have kept up with inflation, right? And that's, that's their, their income. It's not even, uh, the, it's not even their, their ability to save money. Uh, we also took away people's ability to make money. Um, and that's becoming an increasingly, to get back to the question, right? That's becoming an increasingly uh, bigger problem. Um, because uh, for, for many years, what, uh, what did people do to react to this change, right? Because it's gradually, it's this boiling frog thing. Uh, first, uh, First, they're, they're usually the, the wives also had to get a job to keep up, right? In, in 50 years ago, uh, usually one person could support a family on a single income. So that's the first thing that disappeared. Now you have two people working full time. Um, the next happened that people couldn't afford to buy anymore. More and more people are forced to rent. 
Um, and now we have a situation where uh, if you're in any big city, um, on the, on the median salary, sometimes you can't even afford rent. So how do you fix this? Right. Um, Bitcoin for sure doesn't fix us this because, um, it doesn't magically create jobs, uh, where you need humans for, um, for the average person, right? It creates lots of opportunities for highly intelligent people or people who were early to Bitcoin. It might create some jobs where, you know, some, some OG Bitcoiner now spends their Bitcoin, right? But that's a very small part of the economy. And the majority of people, uh, will ask for and also need some help in the form of, uh, a UBI, universal basic income. Uh, will need to happen at some point, right? Uh, we're already seeing, uh, things, uh, tried, right? We had in the US the stimulus checks, which were basically the same thing. In, in, in Austria, we have this Klima bonus, right? Which is a few hundred euros, but it's a start, right? So you're, uh, you're, you're, you're just giving everyone money um, and of course uh, that causes inflation um, and you know the politicians aren't dumb they know this problem so I think uh, that's why they're pushing these CBDCs um, because with the CBDCs you can uh, give people this money but you can also control how they spend it right um, uh, in Germany, I think they're, they're using this. Now they're using it for immigrants, right? They give them a special uh, credit card for, for their daily purchases. But this card can't be used, let's say, to buy Bitcoin or to, you know, to change this money to anything that holds value. Um, so that's, I think, uh, one of the required features of a C CBDC. They're not saying that's the, that's what it will have, but um you if you if you give people a UBI and uh, allow them to spend it on Bitcoin, you know what will happen, right? Um bit, Bitcoin will go to a million and um uh the, the whole idea falls flat, right? Um so you you need to control it somehow. It's I know it sounds dystopian, I don't like the idea myself, but uh that would be one 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 way to get out of this uh, of of this of this uh, unemployment problem we will have, um, and um, of course, what will then happen, right? Let's say we have the CBDC for a few years. Um, if you still have a job, an income, uh, and you have half a brain, you will put put your real money into bitcoin or some some assets right but primarily the people will 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 put it into bitcoin and uh more and more people will will wake up and and understand this right it's it's it feels slow from the inside um if you're if you're bitcoin for for many years it, it feels very slow this adoption uh, but i think it's it's really fast if you also compare it to to other technology adoptions bitcoin is the fastest growing technology on the adoption. So I think that that might happen. So we will have for, for some time this parallel system of CBDCs where you cannot, you can spend it on groceries, right? You can spend it on your electrician bill, but you cannot spend it on Bitcoin or you cannot spend it to buy a house or save it, right? They have this, that's even official, you have this 3000 euro uh, limit planned where you cannot have more then 3,000 euros in your wallet. So uh, that's also the idea, right? You, you're forced to spend it all. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I see that's, that's inevitable. And the, the question then is, of course, how, how will they finance it, right? How will we have, how will we have taxes on a Bitcoin standard? That's always a question that people ask. And um, in, in my book, we have, uh, a system called Lattice, which is basically uh, like in medieval times, uh, if you wanted to enter the city, 
you had to pay a fee, right? So imagine you're in the future, you want to go to a Bitcoin standard area, can be a city, can be a country, can be a space station. Uh, you need to deposit collateral in Bitcoin. It, you're allowed to enter. And then if you misbehave, and that's the, that's the important thing, right? If you misbehave, they, they can take this from you. Because uh, unless you give it willingly in form of collateral, no one can take your Bitcoin. Um, so how do you enforce a legal system on a Bitcoin standard? Uh, you need to tell people, hey, you want to uh, live in, in, in this country, you want to do business here. Uh, we require, you know, some, some deposit of Bitcoin. And then you're, you know, you're basically a citizen. And if you, if you misbehave, and this could be done, you know, we're multisig, so you would have a multisig address with you and the government. Um, or whatever, you know, institution that, that controls this area or, or gives you access to infrastructure. And yeah, that could be a, a model for a Bitcoin standard. In the, in the short term, I think what governments will do is they will use things like carbon tax, stuff like that, right? You cannot flee it because if you want to live there, uh, you want to drive a car, you want to uh, buy something, you want to build something, there's, uh, there's a carbon thing attached to it. And uh, that might be a way to also uh, tax Bitcoiners, right? Because they're saying, hey, you, everyone pays the carbon tax. It's not the base for your carbon tax is not your income because that's gone basically. The base of your carbon tax is your actual carbon emissions. And either they use a social credit system to determine that or they will actually calculate it, right? That, that we will see how this will work. Um, but I imagine something like that in the, in the, in the near future, um, how the world will, will go. Again, uh, Austria, Austria's newest development is a good example here where they have this Klima bonus. So they give everyone money and then uh, pull out the money again uh, through a carbon tax. It's, it's uh, for me as a, a very libertarian person, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> but I guess, <laughs> but I guess uh, we, we, we have to go through the, with this and, and we have to make the best out of yeah. this. And uh, we also have to look on an individual level where we're like, oh, okay, we, we have Bitcoin, we work hard, we, we do our stuff. And uh, if, if, if one government in uh, one part of the world is making some Something bad. We can always move to some some other place. Uh, so there's like uh, as long as there's the option, uh, it's, it's it's good. Uh, and uh, till now, I also saw. I think I got the letter for the Klima bonus this year, like a mm -hmm. week ago, something like that. And I was like, what's that? Why do I get that? Like I. I'm a person mm -hmm. who does not need that. So why are they even giving me me money? That's like, it's, it's, yeah, it, does exactly. not, it does not make sense to give someone from the government just a hand or just a, a helicopter money uh, to people who don't even uh, are, um, are not even in need. If they, for example, have like, oh, we have some crisis, there are a lot of um, unemployed po persons and we need like short term um, relief, then I could even understand it to a certain extent, even if I, I'm not the biggest fan of that still, uh, but I couldn't understand that or I feel like, oh, okay, we, we want to subsidize students and like, let's, let's give them something. I don't know. Like I, I'm not a fan of, of handouts in general, even to people that, that actually need it uh, because I think it, it interrupts with the free market uh, and that's uh, usually not a good idea, uh, but that's a little bit more understandable than just like giving money to everyone. I mean, there's different layers to that. Like there's like a thing that everyone gets and then there's above a thing, but it, it does not, it's not a big, yeah. big, big yeah. jump on that. I've, I think so the I, had, basic... I had a few, I had a few thoughts on that. Um, so one, one part is going back to this unemployment crisis, right? Um, what, what is the reaction of, of, of governments to, seeing the, the value of labor evaporating, uh, they create more bureaucracy. They create more regulation because 
if if it's just for the for the base cost, right? Uh, a house would cost fifty thousand uh, euros. Um, it's all the regulation, uh, all the permits, all the you know you need to get all kinds of expert opinions, right? You need this uh, permit for for building, so that drives up the cost in a in a huge way. That creates jobs. Same with this with this uh, clim clima bonus and all these other things. They they create all this bureaucracy around a thing. Um, and then you you get this this handout, uh, but you need to tax it, right? It's not tax free. You need to tax it. So I I had a similar thought when when I got this letter. Uh, like, can I can I not get it because it actually costs me more in in tax attorney fees to <laughs> to to tax this than actually I, I I benefit from this. So it's just it's 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 a it's a jobs program for me. All these all these uh, things are part also creating bureaucracy and, and making the system run. And of course, it's, it's, it's jobs for the friends of the politicians. It's, it's never a, a, a free market. So yeah, I share your criticism on that. Um, I still think it, it will happen because uh, most people are not educated enough or not uh, free enough. It's also a huge part to, to fight this system. Um, Sure, you can take your you can take your Bitcoin and move to El Salvador, but if you if you have a family, if you have friends here, um, that's that's becoming increasingly unlikely, and that's how they trap you in their system. Um, my advice for young people would be to uh, try this early, very early, to to set to set themselves up uh, for you know an international presence. Um, because as you get older, it becomes increasingly harder to do that because you're tied to all these things in your life, right? To a, to a job, to relatives, to, to friends, to family. You have your kids in school and, uh, you can't, you can't easily move them, move your whole family to El Salvador. Let's say there are other things involved you need to consider. So there's that. That's how they trap you in this, in the system. So I think even if we if we go the very dystopian route, right? The government says, "Hey, we we create a wealth tax. Uh, you need to disclose all your Bitcoin holdings, or you're a criminal." Right? Uh, I think a very small percentage will actually leave. Um, most will just take it and pay their two percent or whatever. But that's what uh, I think. Uh, he, he, so yes and no a little bit. Um, we have this really popular example. I forgot uh, which city it was, but it was a city on on uh, on the seaside where the the people living there was complaining that all the rich people came there. They used the restaurants and everything like there, and then they uh, did not pay taxes because they were like just sitting on the on the ships and they were not residents there. I mean, they pay the taxes when they uh, um, uh, bought for coffee, basically, but uh, indirectly. Um, but they had no other taxes. And then uh, the politics actually changed in that regard. Uh, and uh, people actually started, like uh, the, the people that are in the boats there would have actually have to pay taxes. Um, and then before, the day before the, the law was uh, putting in, in, in place, Every of every one of those boats just left and went to another uh, thing. So, so yes and no. I think um, Bitcoin is highly fleeable money. Uh, Bitcoin is like really easily transferred to another country because it's it's not physically in a country. Like you just like have to twelve yeah. words. You can give this twelve words uh, <laughs> to someone else in another country, and basically it's there. And uh, and you can destroy every 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 ed evidence of those twelve words in your country, um, then there's like no thing of that. Um, but I like, I agree with you that most people want to be honest. They will not uh, say, Oh, I don't have Bitcoin. Like, I think even if, if like actual police comes to your door and asks you like how many Bitcoins you have, I think only a small percentage of people will say, Oh, I lost it in a boating accident. This funny meme that yeah. we all say now, exactly. I, th I think not a lot of people will uh, will actually go through with that. <laughs> no, because that's also a, a very bad thing to do. Uh, if you you cannot say you lost it in a boating accident, because then you basically declare 
that if this ever moves again, this Bitcoin ever moves again, uh, you lied, right? And then you go to jail. Um, so what you could say is that you were mugged or that you were hacked, right? Uh, I store my, you could say I store my Bitcoin in my physical wallet, right? My seed phrase, I store it in my physical wallet because whatever reason, um, not advocating you should do that, but you could. And uh, what if you get mo get mugged, right? You could make that argument. It would still be a hard sell, but um, saying a boating accident, in my opinion, is a, is a bad take. Um, no. But you covered on something uh, very important here. I think uh, that uh, what you said that um, only a small percentage of people uh, will be able to leave the system, right? Or leave, are leaving the system. I think that's why Bitcoin has been successful and is successful um, because uh, it's not 100% anonymous. Uh, if it were, they would have banned it already or tried to kill it early, you know, because if there was a perfect way to avoid taxes, uh, take away all your money, go somewhere else. If this was perfect and foolproof, um, you know, they would fight it harder. But uh, as it is now, and it's only a very small percentage of people, and many of them get caught if they do illegal stuff, right? Because it's a public ledger. And basically only if you're actually fleeing a country of war, or you're actually uh, moving to another country legally, right? Then, it's, it's, uh, then it happens, then it's not an issue. I think that's what's 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 helping also Bitcoin that it's it's not perfect in that regard. Never thought about that that uh, the public ledger is uh, e even even good for helping it to authorities to accept it and and getting the way you know in also there in like a game theory move. Uh, interesting. Uh, you, you brought up a few points today that I never thought about before. Like I had to I have to do some research after that. <laughs> I love it, and, and I. That's I the point, it. right? Yeah, and, and this is actually like uh, it comes up uh, less and less because I have every day a Bitcoin podcast, uh, and you're my number one hundred and fifty nine. So I've heard from a lot of people their opinion on Bitcoin and their angle on Bitcoin and, and their knowledge about Bitcoin. Uh, so it becomes less and less that there's something new coming up, and uh, there were some interesting talking points today in there and and uh, I always love Bitcoin because I'm now in there for like what is it four years I think it's now over four years even uh, and and still there's things coming up there's like oh this I never considered that and and, and oh I didn't know about that and it's it's still yeah still still going but, down uh, the it's the same for everyone um, I, by, by writing these stories, I discovered things about Bitcoin I never considered before. Um, it's it's interesting. Uh, you can you can open a new angle, uh, like you pick any angle, uh, and you find new understanding about Bitcoin. That's that's really interesting. Um, I Bitcoin. thought I understood it. I thought I understood it when I first heard about it. Uh, I think that was 20, 2012 or something. But uh, the more you learn about it, the more you take it seriously. It's also a big point, right? Everyone underestimates Bitcoin for for forever, right? I think still you under, underestimates it. Michael Saylor underestimates it. Everyone does it, and that's just uh, this. This you have to accept that you will you will learn something new. You will always be ignorant about Bitcoin, uh, and that's a good thing. That's a, that's a great way to, to come closer to our end routine uh, where we are saying, Bitcoin, you can never be bullish enough. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you can't. No, I all, said uh, $1 trillion per Satoshi. That's, uh, that's my price prediction. $1 trillion per Satoshi. Um, that's, yeah, I, I will put that in the thumbnail with, per Bitcoin then. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a great clickbait, he uh, clickbait headline for sure. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> then uh, we come to our end routine uh, where we have now two questions in the end routine. The first question is always the same question for every guest uh, where I want to give the stage to the Bitcoiners so we can learn from each other um, besides Bitcoin. 
So what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? What are you currently learning about besides Bitcoin? Question. Um, I'm passionate about writing. That's, that's what also Bitcoin, first of all, allowed me to do and also inspired me to do. So uh, it's a, it's a long hedge, it was a long hedge dream of mine for, for many, many, many years to, to start writing on something. Uh, and, and that's what I'm passionate about right now. Um, bringing my, my world that, uh, my world somehow out into reality, uh, telling the stories I, I came up with. I love it a lot. And, and writing is extremely important to uh, sort your thoughts and then actually uh, dive deeper in your own brain. And it's, it's, uh, I, I, I'm also getting a little bit more in, in writing uh, and it's, uh, it's a lovely experience. Um, our other end, end routine uh, is where the previous guest is uh, asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually the next guest is. Mm -hmm. um, and your question from the previous guest is, what will be the tipping point for Bitcoin mass adoption? So like, what's, what do you think will be the trigger point uh, when we like, we, when we switch from uh, um, uh, uh, slowly then suddenly, like what is it to, uh, that's not, then suddenly, what was the thing before, not slowly? I know what you mean, but I also don't know the exact uh, definition. Actually, yeah, but you know, it. Um, I forgot the word. But, but, but to answer that, um, I think what's unique about Bitcoin is that this this moment will never come. It's it's it will gradually increase in adoption, and it's it's like you're you're growing you're growing up, right? Can you can you name a moment when you were like now I'm an adult? Uh, probably not. I mean, some people have a story, right? Um, but it's been a, a gradual uh, climb, and uh, that's that's interesting. I think. Every individual will have this moment for them. I guess uh, both of us already had this moment in their in their past, where they they had this suddenly moment for Bitcoin, right? They it was an afterthought for many years. You heard about it, you maybe researched it, maybe invested a bit, but at some point you were like, "Whoa, this 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 thing is huger than I, I think." So I think every person will have this moment at at some point, but it's it's not a, it's not going to be a global event. It's going to be a an, an individual experience for everyone. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I now know it gradually, then suddenly, because you also said the word yeah. uh, gradually, and now now I know it again. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. Uh, that this will be like uh, also an individual um, experience on that. Um, perfect. And before I can let you go, uh, where can people uh, reach you? Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, please follow me on X. Uh, the handle is uh, Ratoshi21. Uh, and also look on my Instagram, uh, Ratificial. Like artificial, but with rats. Amazing. Yeah, I will put your X handle also in, in the, the description so people can uh, directly go there and, and, and check out your, your stories and, and, and your, your things. Uh, then, yeah, thank you, uh, Ratoshi, for, for being on and for everyone watching and listening. Uh, thank you for being here and I'll be back to uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. Yeah, and thank you for giving giving me a space to, to talk about my ideas. It's uh, appreciated a lot. <laughs>